Good morning everyone. Sorry, I'm just quickly getting this right. Welcome to our next training video in Luke's Gospel, Luke 11 verses 29 to 54. Just important to know, we haven't preached on this passage. We might be referred to in the Sunday sermon, but for this week, we'll only be doing it in our fellowship groups. So take a moment to pray, ask the Lord to lead you, open your Bibles in this passage, maybe read it before you even get to it, familiarize yourself with it, and let's get going. But just a couple of things I want to highlight. Just contextually, it's important to remember that it's the same context as our previous passage, meaning in Luke chapter 11, verse 16, we read that others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. So that's our context. It's still the same context, people resisting Jesus, doubting Jesus. But of course, in the previous passage, Jesus picked up in verse 15 regarding Beelzebub. But in this passage... Jesus is picking up this request for a sign from heaven, which is a ridiculous request. Because actually there have been signs from heaven in Luke's gospel. For example, Luke 3.22 and Luke 9.34-35. Jesus was confirmed by God the Father to be his son. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. So it's not as if there weren't signs from heaven. And importantly, Jesus performed, as Luke 7.22-23 highlights, Numerous signs pointing to his identity, pointing to the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. So it's actually a ridiculous request for a sign from heaven, which actually points out, as Jesus mentions in this passage in Luke 11, is this is a wicked generation. Of course, like any generation, but a wicked generation who continually, even though all the signs are there, they continue to resist him. And so it's interesting that Jesus says the only thing that's left for them in this section of verses 29 to 32 is the sign of Jonah. Now, very importantly, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah, Matthew chapter 12. But here he refers to Jonah's death experience in the valley of the fish. When Jonah in Jonah 2 verse 1 to 2 says, From the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to God and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. And Jesus says, just like Jonah was for three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus makes a link there regarding Jonah's experience with the fish and his own experience when he will die on the cross and be buried in a tomb. But interestingly, in our passage in Luke 11, that is not the focus. Here, the sign of Jonah refers probably to Jonah 3, 45, when Jonah, when he started into the city, he proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Judgment. Jonah's coming to Nineveh mean judgment. And, but interestingly, there's a difference between the men of Nineveh and the wicked generation Jesus is talking to. Because you see, the men of the Ninevites believed God. So Jesus mentions you are receiving the same sign of judgment through my coming, through all these signs, because rejecting me means judgment. But you see, the men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. And he mentions why, for they repented regarding the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. So he's mentioning Jonah's message, it was a sign of God's judgment, yet this wicked generation is not responding like the Ninevites. They responded in faith and repentance while this wicked generation is only responding basically in rejecting him, not listening to him. And so they will be judged. Jesus is coming to them as a sign of judgment. We'll get to that later. But then Jesus moves on there and comes to another analogy, the lamp and the eye. And just to give you a bit of context regarding this analogy, because Jesus uses it quite a bit. Now in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 to 16 is the first time we pick this up. And he mentions the eye as well in the Sermon on the Mount. But just contextually, I'd like to highlight to you that in Matthew's gospel, the focus of the lamp analogy and the eye are on disciples. He mentions to the disciples that you are the light of the world, just like Jesus is in our context. But he mentions disciples are the light of the world and they shouldn't hide this light. See what he says, let your light shine before others. And he says, so that they may see what your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the focus on the disciples, interestingly, let your light shine through your good works. Those signs of the gospel breaking in your life, into your life. 
Now, interestingly, Jesus mentions the lamp analogy here in Luke 8, 16 to 18. But there's a difference. See, the same idea there. If you don't put it under the basket, no one after the light covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed. The same idea. But interestingly here, in Luke chapter 8, he uses the idea of a lamp regarding his teaching. Because contextually, this analogy occurs after the parable of the sower, which regards Jesus' message. So Jesus says his message in Luke 8, 16 to 18, it's like a lamp shining into a dark place. And he warns the people, take care then how you hear. That parable of the sower. How you hear. So the focus here is not on works, but on Jesus' message. But interestingly, in Luke 11, where we are now, because of verse 16, give us a sign. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you a sign, a sign of judgment, through his works and his message. It takes on a different character. He uses the lamp analogy again, but here again, the focus is on Jesus' works, the signs he's given that he is the light. And unlike Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, where the focus is on the disciples, in Luke's gospel, in both times when the lamp analogy is used, the focus is on himself. And he says, basically, you don't hide the light. He didn't hide the light. He didn't hide his signs that those who enter may see the light. But you notice he says there's a problem. It's our response. And he uses the analogy of the eye, your eye, as the, a symbol of your response. Basically pointing out if your eye is healthy, if you're good, if you're single-mindedly devoted to God, then you will let this light come into your life and light your body, if that makes a sense. But if your eye is bad, corrupt, then your body is full of darkness. And there again he says, basically, you must be careful. Do you, oh, you must respond by allowing the light of Jesus to shine into your light, because he is the light. Isaiah 9 points that out. Luke's gospel kicks off calling Jesus the light. And so he's saying to them, I'm going to give you the sign, but you must respond. You must open your eye, have a healthy eye to receive this light. And so we see the sign of Jonah and the lamp in the eye analogy actually coming to a head in the last section in Luke 11 verses 29 to 54. This is quite key. So Jesus says, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah, judgment. I'm going to let this light shine. So the question is, how will they respond? What type of eye do the religious leaders have who are instigating all this doubt? And we see Jesus' light shining. It's not a pleasant experience for the religious leaders, the message of Jonah coming. And he pronounces six woes on the Pharisees and on the experts of the law. It's summarized for you here. It's external religion, the self-elevating religion, hypocritical religion, the rejection of true religion, really, the prophets. Their religion is death for people and it will lead to the judgment of everyone who follows them. But here's the sad part of this passage. It's not so much Jesus shining this light into their dark, the dark place. But we see their response. They did not respond by opening their eyes to embrace the light of Jesus. They began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, wanting to catch him in something he might say. They're really showing that their eyes are bad and in their hearts and in their bodies is darkness. And it will lead to what Jesus said, condemnation. And really the climax of this is reached in Luke 19, 41 to 44. It's the saddest point, really, because Jesus walks to Jerusalem. When he reaches Jerusalem, he says, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, his light. But he says, Your enemies, because you've rejected it, your enemies will dark, will dash you, sorry, dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Basically, you shut your eyes to the light of God's message, light of God's word coming to you in the person of Jesus. And so what you really want your people to walk away with, of course, is the link between Jesus and judgment. Meaning the more you know, the more accountable you are in the sense, if you know the gospel of Jesus and you reject it like but he's already emphasized this in Luke chapter 10 and again in chapter 11. Is you're worse off. You're more accountable. You've received the message of salvation. But to reject it means judgment. But then also realize the link between our heart condition, the I, and our response to Jesus. It's important to see that it was self-righteousness 
that blinded the Pharisees, made them unwilling to see who Jesus is. It's a tragic passage, but it's an important one for us to see. And I'd say that in a heart, no, and basically in a heartbeat or in a nutshell, is what Luke 11 verses 29 to 54 is all about.